So it is truly um, very, very important time for me to be able to uh, introduce this friend and I would say mentor who has come all the way from El Salvador to speak with us here at the Kennedy School. She, uh, Nilda Kotesak, arrived in El Salvador 40 years ago and uh, from communist Hungary, quite a shift. And she immediately saw the poverty and the need that existed in that country. And I think she was ahead of the curve when it came to ideas of social entrepreneurship and social change and social justice. Those are all, those all become very sexy today. Uh, however, she was really at the ground floor with that, uh, that, that focus in El Salvador. And she and her family have made incredible contributions to that country, uh, I think, uh, that have really impacted uh, children and adults, especially children and women. So I've asked her to present today to us about her part of her journey into being a humanitarian uh, philanthropist, educator, human rights advocate. So some of the personal story, but also some of the work that she's done to date in El Salvador to give us an idea of how we can connect to those ideas in our own work as we move forward in life. And so it's great, with great pleasure I introduce Ildiko Tesa. Thank you. Hi. In the morning, I saw the teacher, uh, Miss uh, Kellerman. Yeah, Barbara Kellerman. There's a Kellerman. paper, you know, showing if you have one minute to talk or something <laughs> like that. So please, you just make some sign for me to stop. Uh, Eric told me uh, that I could prepare a speech about 40 minutes and then to ask questions for 15, 20 minutes. And maybe. I would like to change it, I don't know. I, I used to say I made my homework, so it's ready. <laughs> and I'm starting to read it. But maybe if you have a question or you want to interrupt, it's okay. Okay, I can go back and read it, okay? So, um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today with you. And I would like to thank the Harvard Kennedy School, the Carr Center and the Latin American Studies Program and the cultural agent for the opportunity to speak about my work in El Salvador over the last two decades, seeking ways to alleviate and reduce poverty. I was born in a small village in communist Hungary. After finishing high school, I moved to Budapest to study law. I never thought of leaving my country, nor was I interested in learning other languages, but was forced to learn Russian. Many years later, in the difficult process of learning Spanish and English, I often remembered my Russian teacher who was convinced and frequently told me that I didn't have any talent for languages. In May 31st, 1966, an incredible event took place in my life. I didn't know until years later that would become the turning point that changed my life. I met my future husband, Pavlo Tesak, who was born in the new Czechoslovakia after the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and immigrated to Central America in 1949. In 1951, he started his own business with a Salvadorian partner, just with $3.20 in his pocket. Pablo did not re receive a formal training in this field, yet he became as a dear American friend used to refer to him as the snack food king of Central America. 20 years later, his company, Diana, became one of the leading business in the region, an example of efficient management and outstanding commitment to the well-being of the employees. In 1970, I traveled to El Salvador to marry Pablo. It was my first visit to the Western world. When I arrived, I was shocked to see the number of hungry, uneducated, poor people. Salvadorians are generous, friendly, and hardworking people. However, El Salvador is a country of profound contradictions. The warmth of its climate and the kindness of its people contrasted with the cold rigidity of its class society. A society characterized by exclusion inequality and denial of access to a better life. 
high levels of social, economic, and political polarization led to the civil war in the late 70s, early 80s. My husband was right when he used to say, if children can do better than their parents, there is going to be social conflict. Adding, everybody wants to get ahead and everybody should have a chance to progress. For security reason, we moved to California in 1980. And for the next six and a half years, my husband was commuting between both countries, a result of his great commitment to the factory and its workers, and his desire to defend the free market economy. After reuniting the family in El Salvador in 1986, I started to search for a suitable occupation, just as the war was escalating. A new government took office, promoting free market economy rather than a state-controlled one. During the transition period towards a new economic model, the government encouraged the business sector to get involved actively. My husband was founding member of several new private sector foundations aimed to promote education and economic growth. One foundation was FEPADE, which was created to improve the quality of the nation's educational system. I was invited to be a member of FEPADE's board of directors. In 1992, a peace, uh, accord, a peace agreement was signed and the reconstruction plan was implemented to rebuild the nation after years of devastating civil war. Substantial social insertion plans needed to be devised to make possible the transition to civilian life for many former guerrilla and army combatants. Two important organizations that served as partners in this effort were Social Investment Fund, FIS, and FEPADE. FIS principally rebuilt public structures like schools, bridges, clinics, city market latrines. FEPADE was res responsible for providing basic household goods and training for the former combatants from both sides to assist them in the transition to a new civilian life. During my 10 years in FEPADE, I was also a member of two working groups. One of them promoted technical training to reduce the deficit of skilled workforce caused mainly by migration during the civil war, and other group promoted quality education through scholarship and distribution to textbooks at affordable prices. Several international institutions started to help the country. The Inter-American Inter Development Bank gave 40 million US dollars through a soft loan to create a social investment fund where I was invited to join of the board of directors. The first event organized by FIS was a two-day conference named How to Alleviate Poverty in Central America, presenting examples of, succe of successful initiatives undertaken in different areas of the country to reduce the hardship caused by civil war. One of the NGOs presenting successful initiatives was the Women Entrepreneurial Association, OEF. And after I heard their presentation, I knew it was my calling. I learned that an international organization called Overseas Educational Fund had opened a small, small office in the city and department of San Vicente to teach poor, illiterate, single women, head of the families, how to start a small business at home by caring their children. Due to security reason and situation, the Overseas Educational Fund closed their office in El Salvador. The employees decided to organize the local Salvadorian NGO with the same vision and objective as those of the international organization. I decided to learn more about the project of Women Entrepreneurial Association. So I began visiting rural communities where they were training poor women using innovative methodologies. After several visits, I decided to support and, if possible, improve the work of OEF. My main concern was the success of the women and a better future for the children. 
Each woman who participate, participated in the training was fueled by dreams and hopes to which nobody previously had thought to respond. So our training program was laden with heavy expectations and we couldn't let them down. We understood that the participants should be at walking distance from the place where the training was scheduled because they couldn't spend money on transportation. A lot of times two or three women fainted during the training and later we discovered that they didn't have dinner the night before or breakfast the day of the training and they had to walk two, two and a half hours. Most of the participants arrived for the training with their children. At that time, they stayed together during the whole course and in many cases, children understood the concept faster than their mothers. In order to improve efficiency of the training, we needed to separate the children and leave them with a responsible adult to entertain them adequately. So, I realized that we needed to organize daycare centers to allow women more time to work, both on their household obligations and time to develop a new, successful small business. One of the participants offered us a small place in her house. Then and there, we started our early childhood education program. Today we have 16 daycare centers with more than 500 children, all of them initiating a healthier childhood with basic education at the age of three. Yeah, okay. And you, you can explain those a little bit to us later too, how, how you put those together, uh, perhaps. Okay, okay. Just to tell you, we have another group with 400 children, and then I wanted to stop. It was just right when I wanted to stop. So we have another group that they are from um, between 6 and 14, and they go from first grade to eighth grades because they are people that they drop off from school and they want to go back and they want to study. And we call them high school social groups. So if we don't have them, definitely they go to the street, street children, or they go to crime or prostitution. So it's very important for them. And we have eight of those uh, groups and they are about like 400 people. What is interesting really, and I don't know, but for me is this hope that this, uh, every and all of the women that they came to us, they have inside. And uh, at the beginning, I'm sure I was chosen because I wanted to help everybody new around the neighborhood, but uh, they were a little bit strange because they wanted me go to the traditional way of a foreigner and the wife of a businessman who doesn't need to work, you know. Uh, so they said, oh, why do you are not taking painting lesson or you could uh, take a swimming lesson and, and, and tennis or so. But I did tennis and I love it. I did swimming. I never learned it. I know how when it's no deep, but otherwise I just, <laughs> I did one more about that one. And, and I was always like I wanted to help. So they invited me to, to these two organizations, but it's because Pablo, Pablo was an honest, well-known guy, so why not Mrs. Desai to come? But uh, then I just enjoyed it, and I, they just couldn't stop me. And I did things that uh, I, I wanted to, to be absolutely sure that the objectives are met. For example, in FISEL, Fondo de Inversión Social, con el licenciado Mura y Mesa, I am making these names because the two Salvadorian present, they know uh, licenciado Mura y Mesa. Uh, he decided that the board of directors should not get any payment at all for the participation. And then we wanted to show to the people that an organization who have, is managing $40 million, you know, transparency, honesty, it was our deal. And that the poor people, that we are to serve to the poor people, like, uh, making latrines, and we said, okay, if the group is organized and they come to us, they have priority against the mayor who wants to make a, a market because of the re-election. So it's not really the, the people. So I was going there to the waiting room, uh, and, uh, and I was saying, what time did you get here? How long are you waiting here? You know, because I felt that it's not fair that old people, that they are working on a salary basis, they are drinking coffee or they are smoking. So I, I was a little bit like, when Mrs. Tesak is coming, <laughs> they, they acted like, uh, 
the, I, I don't say they were all very nice people, but the same, we were not a government organization, but, but an autonome organization, but still they were taking it easy. And some of the people from the villages, they were leaving at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, and waiting in the uh, dining room. So I went to the community. I was talking to them, come, take advantage of this money, because we don't know uh, if it's going on long or not. And for sure, uh, after the first four years, a new government came, uh, 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 Presidente Calderon Sol, and he wanted to put one of his friends. And it went till on, and no, it's completely different. But I stayed there for, for the whole first four years. But in Fepade, for example, when I'm reading that we wanted the uh, guerrilla, uh, ex-guerrilla fighters and the army to go back to, to normal civilian life, uh, I met people, and know they are in the government because we have a, a new government since last year. They did not come to the city for six or eight years. Some of the ladies, she's a doctor of medicine, said she just uh, the first time got back to San Salvador from the mountain because she needed a, a reading glass. She couldn't uh, read any any more. So for them, it was very difficult. And. Um, for a long, long, long time, they felt that the civil war, the cause of the civil war was the Soviet Union manipulation and uh, wanted to make a communist country of El Salvador. So they were very much against the United States and they were kind of against the private sector. So when, uh, with a friend of us, we went to visit and offer technical training to the ex combatants uh, they were not very friendly, really. So we arrived, and everybody needed to stand up and tell your name where you are coming from. <laughs> so the friend of mine, she said, uh, we are coming from Fepade, and it's money from the United States, and it's for training and a, and a private enterprise. I said, OK. So my turn came. And before I could open my mouth, the big chief, uh, Guerilla, said, uh, are you a gringa or a turca? Uh, both uh, supposed to be an insult, you know, because <laughs> uh, turca means an Arab who arrived a long time ago, but it's a foreigner kind of, you know. So when he told me that, I said, no, I am not turca, not gringa, but you can find out which country I was born. So when you find out, you tell me. If not, I am a Salvadorian. <laughs> so, uh, but, yeah. <laughs> So later, later uh, we went to the camp. Uh, they were showing us uh, the school, the teaching area. They showed us the clinic and everything. And uh, at the beginning, they even said, oh, but this lady, she is not on the list of the visitors. And they said, but she is the one who needs to sign the check. So if she cannot go, it's, you know, I don't think so you can have the money. So they let me go. But the funny thing, when I was leaving or we were leaving, they didn't let us speak to the people. They were just the big, big uh, leaders. So, but when we were, go, we were leaving, then they said, many regards to Don Pablito, my husband. So after all, they knew who am I, but they made this nice, I don't know what was it. But uh, the thing is that, that I decided to enjoy this other company, the small, insignificant in San Vicente, uh, uh, an hour away from, from the city. And as I say, I, I enjoyed being there because it was not tied to any power group or any like religious or, or organization. And they had a special way of teaching and a special way how to organize the group. For example, we said, you don't need to read and write to be able to come and learn with us. So uh, every and all of the uh, training started with a self-esteem course. And we started to give them names of vegetables, like you are a tomato, you are a cucumber, because they were shy and they were lost. So they started to laugh. And it's always helped if you are laughing a little bit. So uh, and then we had characters, different kind of characters uh, that they can uh, easily identify in their everyday life. So um, we didn't have any problem to organize the groups. They were really 
uh, coming uh, uh, because they 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 had this hope that I was talking about. The uh, important thing was that after the self-esteem uh, part of the training, it was the business training, and we tried to cover every aspect of the training, like about pricing or product or see what they want to do and if there is a market for them and so on and so on. But a lot of times it was like use your common sense. But definitely you as a woman, you can do, you can do, that's for sure. Uh, so this, these were adult, local? They women. were, were adult with lot of children. They were like four, six uh, children around that, that mm -hmm. uh, woman that they were coming. So they were adults. But then we started the daycare centers that they were small children. So, but just a little bit uh, uh, about that. The second part about the business, they had uh, more than that a woman who was irresponsible and sending the money of the business and so on and so on. But uh, what we wanted them to do and feel the important that they finish that course. So we made a very, very meaningful celebration and we celebrated that they decided to make changes. So uh, you cannot uh, wait for a different result if you don't make changes in, in your life. And they were willing to make these changes to get out of poverty. So uh, if they had a church in that community that we were uh, making the training, then they went for a mass. And if not, we were always invited a priest for the blessing and, and for kind of the praying, that, that part of the culture that's very important for them. And later we had an honor table with special guests, and children came, they were dancing and singing, and then they made, the women, they made social drama or a play. And uh, generally they were speaking about the difficulties to get permission from the men of the house if they had. So the two women, they were always acting like, why you are going there? What you are going to study? Maybe you, you want to be, uh, you know, uh, doing not, not correct things or get a boyfriend or who knows, you know, jealousy as, as, as always, you know, like in a macho society. Uh, but a lot of times uh, we had leaders in the community like Doña Rosita in one of the communities. So if Doña Rosita was organizing the group or Doña Rosita was inside, then it was okay. It was no jealousy. They said it's okay. But later, jealousy was always there. So this Doña Rosita, uh, they had four children, and she was uh, having like a chicken, chicken uh, farm business kind of. She didn't have any transportation, so she was sending the chickens to the city by pickups or buses and to the offices and uh, all of the, her children studied, but, uh, and they were able to buy a, a, a small TV because of the job of Doña Rosita. But when he was drunk and he was mad, he was just throwing the computer to the floor and he was upset that, that uh, she was successful and he was not, so it's another complicated situation. But anyway, so going back, uh, in this big celebration, uh, they were telling their problems, and it, it, in a funny way, it was interesting. And every and each of them had a, a certificate of participation with a, with a photograph. And they were taking pictures, and we were congratulating them. And they had a refreshment and some kind of uh, eating or, or, or drinking. So, uh, and we encouraged them to make the changes in their life and, and try to, to make a, a better living for their family. Uh, two very important messages that we were always telling them that uh, it's better to be alone than be in a bad company so somebody who is going to take advantage of them uh, and the other thing is uh, try to get solution for your problems don't come back to us and say this is my headache if you need credit because we have credit you need to learn something else, come back, but you need to be able to solve your problems. And, and after the training and after a really like few months, they were, they were able to, to, to do that. Uh, very interesting stories I can, I can tell you, but for example, a lady, uh, her children, they were fighting in the guerrilla, uh, uh, in the mountains, and uh, in the radio, uh, Radio Venceremos, do you remember? 
So uh, she said, okay, if you come to work with me in my shop, then I can send you to the university. And she used her head, and she was never, ever visiting the capital, San Salvador, but suddenly she used her head, this is the story she is telling, so she went to a factory that they, they were making um, like uniforms and they had leftovers and they were selling these leftovers different colors for, for scraps, the Scraps, material scraps. Uh -huh, scraps, mm -hmm. uh, desperdicio in Spanish. So she was buying like 20 uh, uh, pounds of this scrap. This scraps. Thing? Scraps. And then she decided to make underwear and pyjama. And she has very good taste, so the, the, the sleeves of the pyjama one is a different color. And she went to the neighborhood with a market, and she left, left there the merchandise. So uh, that's the way how, how we really want them to, to, to work. So uh, in 1992, the United States government started two new projects. One was uh, preventive maternal and child health care, and the other straight children. So OEF, my organization, at that time I was already the president of the organization, we applied and we, we got in this to uh, uh, help. Uh, the preventive maternal and child health care uh, started uh, with a pregnant woman and we uh, needed to register and then we needed to teach them a new ways of uh, nutrition, a basis of soya, soya milk, hamburger, and so on and so on, that it's not in the uh, traditional diet, that it's uh, corn and rice and beans. So uh, the idea is that the boy or the girl is uh, in a better condition from the minute that they are born, and then we need to, to register uh, their growth. And uh, the prevention is that they don't get sick, they don't have malnourished, they are going and and then uh, our part, we wanted the woman who got all this help to send the children to, to daycare center. So it was already, we felt, a prevention not to, to go to the street. The street children, uh, we went through a, a very a difficult uh, process of, of selection because we had a lot of needy children. Um, these children, they, they uh, were, uh, or they, they suffered abuse and mental traumas. A lot of them they saw to die, they close relatives, you know, they were killed in, in, in the presence of them. So they have four components, health, education, entertainment, and technical training. Uh, we needed to make tests. So, for example, a little girl that the stepfather was abusing her came out drawing. Uh, that we were able later to talk to the mother and say, okay, you need to choose uh, uh, because if not we can use the, uh, call the police, you know, because it's not permitted. Uh, you can choose your, your partner or you can choose the girl, but you cannot go on like this. And very important uh, part was the entertainment, that these children, poor children, abused children, they never had the possibility to make exercise or go to a field trip and so on and so on. Uh, at the beginning, uh, we had a partner in New York, a small organization like Trickle Up. They called it Trickle Up because they felt the poor, help the poor people is going the water up. And they gave $100, but uh, we were able to give $50 at the beginning on the basis of a business plan. So they needed to say what they want to do. And if they were successful and still working after three months, we were able to give the other $50. But in um, 1992 or 94, we um, applied for a small credit that they call it small one. It was half a million dollar from the Inter-American Development Bank. And we applied and we got the money. So uh, since that, we have this uh, microcredit program and we are successfully uh, working with, uh, with uh, village banks and private uh, kind of like uh, loans. And uh, we are reinvesting the money, you know, the interest that we are charging on that loan. So right now we have $3 million uh, for microcredit, and it's not enough. So we could, we could have more, and, and we could have more for the people.
Okay. And you told me there's never been a default. Is that right? Yeah, they were. Uh, they were? Sometimes they are, but uh, but it's really not not. The people in the community have to guarantee the loan, is that No, right? it's just the village banking. You know, the village bank is, uh, I don't know how many of you are, uh, I feel everybody knows everything that I'm saying, so <laughs> you just stop me if you <laughs> said, say, I know that, but we know that. So village bank is if they have like 10 people in the, in the uh, like the village bank, with the president and uh, vice president and so on and so on, and they each of them they have hundred dollars, so they have a thousand dollar, and then they decide who can get the credit and for what. So they know who is responsible, who is working, the daughter is working, son is working, and to pay it back. If not, they need to put from their own money. So that's uh, th this is how it works. But uh, right now, because um, uh, to be efficient and give $100 or $500 and have vehicles and so on and so on, it's not easy. So we have bigger bi bigger clients, like somebody wanted to, to have a copying machine and uh, they have a, a business in the city of San Vicente, so we are able to give them like $10,000, $15,000 for one people, but it's a different kind of guarantee. So um, if you ask me why really I, I I wanted this organization, it's because they uh, were teaching that everybody, not only equal, but everybody can teach the other something. Like maybe you are a PhD and I'm a village woman, but what I do on the village I can teach you and, and I can be better what I do than you. So uh, life experience counts a lot, not formal education. And uh, the other thing is that um, it was, uh, as I told you before, and it was important for me, not to tie to political parties. Uh, because for me, poor people, they really don't need uh, any political color, you know, like they are red or white or whatever, you know, they are poor and they need help. So, um, in our society, and maybe some of your countries, um, the women are the center and the pillar of the family and the community. Uh, we have a lot of irresponsible fatherhood, alcoholism is much is more. So uh, who is really teaching the children and they are always there is the mother and the grandmother. Uh, OEF, we, we are always with the community, but we understood that we need to do something uh, maybe at higher level or, or about uh, policy makers' involvement or changing about uh, fatherhood. In El Salvador, uh, we presented eight changes to the law about um, how do you solve, uh, to, to recognition of, of the father, that uh, reconocimiento de, de, de Legalizing. legalizing a child, you know, legalizing a child, because in El Salvador is the mother and the, the, the son needs to make the, the legal papers and, and the registration, and if the father doesn't want, it's no way. So a lot of, lot of children, they are not registered. So uh, we wanted to change, so it would be the father who need to prove that he is not the father, and, and today it's very easy because they can make the blood test, and so if uh, he has an a invitation to, to recognize a child, he can say, yes, I am the father, or I am not, but I am willing to go and make the blood test and see I am or I am not. The other one, if, if they are the father, but they don't have the family. So we wanted to teach the uneducated woman to say, you have the right, your, your son or daughter has a right, go to the government, go to the uh, right uh, agency, and, and claim for your child, you know, like food or some kind of help for you. But it's just higher education, secondary education, university, where the women, they feel like it's okay to go. And the poor people, they still, that, you know, if, if he doesn't want to give by heart or good heart, then I don't want to, to go and force him. So it's not, not really good. Uh, yes. Do you think we could turn over to questions? Do you have something more you want to? No, no, that's okay. Maybe we could turn over to the okay. questions okay. now, if that's okay. Yeah. But let me just give a picture uh, in terms of Ildiko driving Richter and myself across the country in her 
bulletproof car like a demon. <laughs> and, uh, it's we a went compliment, to, you know. It's to the very, very rural parts of the country, very, very poor parts of the country. I mean, uh, yeah, it's poverty. The, the animals are emaciated, you know, much less than, uh, well, and so you can imagine the, the status of, of people in those areas, right, in terms of the, the challenges they have in everyday life. But the schools that you have built, they all have, they have a kitchen, there's a, a clinic, right, for women to be able to get uh, access to health screenings. And the kids show up, uh, these are the three to six year old children, you know, clean and well dressed and ready to embrace the opportunity and to learn, happy, yes. to engage, you know, and it's, it is very, it's very important for those communities because the options those kids have is really to, as you say, future of gang, being a gang involvement or uh, prostitution. And gang involvement has become so great, you were telling me, I mean, the yes, average amount yes, of homicides yes. now is yes. 13 per day. Yeah, but, but it's very important, but I, I want to say, so it's, I feel that half the poor people, it's like a puzzle. The prevention is what we do, but, but then we, we do like family planning. And uh, it's not easy, because it's, uh, a lot of people, they say, oh, they are promoting free sex. But it's, it's really stupid, or, about, but, or bad intention. It's not a lot of women, they say, you know, unfortunately, I did not know that I could do something like that one, you know, before. So I wish I could do it. So we, we use peer pressure. For young adults, they know who is active in their class, and then they talk about the, the danger of to, to uh, contaminate a sickness or, or how they can prevent it. And we tell them, we tell them, you know, that you need to have the number of children that you need, you can love, educate, a, a, and give them to eat. You know, feed, love, and educate. So that's basic. And and I feel that if we don't do that, and it's not only just in El Salvador, but but everywhere on earth, because that's prevention. We cannot reproduce a lot of children, and then they need to immigrate, and they need to go hell to be able to, to sustain themselves or, or, or the family. So um, so many other things that I, I, I could tell, but maybe you are asking some of the questions, and if not, uh, I will go back. Yes? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have, I have uh, two questions. What is related, you've been uh, mentioning essentially what have been uh, the, uh, the kind of work you do for prevention, the different programs and how the organization grew. Uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about uh, the, the people, uh, the people that have been uh, uh, receiving the program. Uh, and uh, if, you had to if you had to use three words, to describe uh, when a, a woman is successful, why, why, which words would you use to to give meaning to success in the case of, of those women? That, that's a very, very good question. I feel, I feel, I didn't think about it, and maybe not in three words, but when a woman um, she doesn't have a headache, what to give to eat to the children. You know, so that because that's very important, or like the surviving, you know, like I don't like this. Uh, you know, some organizations say, oh, if you have a lot of children, you learn to share. You learn to share, and it's so nice. And, and but you know, it's absolutely not for me. You know, it's a, uh, so it's no headaches. They have enough food to eat, and they can send the children to school. Mm -hmm. So if a woman can do that, and the other very important point for us is unite the family. We are not feminists or we don't say, you know, we need to be together and they need to be together. And, and we have cases where, where the woman is working, but the man is there, sitting there. And if I go to visit, because I go uh, a lot of time, I, I used to say that I, my car works on the basis of gasoline and I work on the basis of coffee and and batteries, solar batteries, so I need to go out to recharge my batteries, yeah. So I go there, and the woman, a man is always in the hammock, and I always ask him, what is your profession? What, what are you doing? They say, I am agriculture. You know, I go to the field, but it's, it's a lie. But at least he does not reproduce more children outside of the house. So that's, that's, that's at least they have a father inside, and, and they have uh, work to do. But 
other thing, for example, this speech that we are giving always. It depends if we are talking to the women or we are talking to young adults because we have technical trainings. So they can have and come an electrician or they can have a, a domestic sewing course or an industrial sewing course so they can get a job for it. So let's say um, I have different uh, kind of like inserts in, in, in a speech. For example, if uh, they are adults, I like to have a joke about God. And I always very, very careful not to get into anybody's feelings, you know, or, or make them feel bad. But I said, you know, like a very poor man goes to the church and, and try to pray and say, God, I have eight children, I'm very poor, please help God. And he's praying and praying. And, and then um, he says, God, please help me to win the lottery. So he doesn't win and goes back and, and suddenly he gets very mad and starts to cry, shout and say, God, don't you see I'm, I'm very poor, I have eight children. And, so. and then God talks to him and says, buy the lottery ticket, help me, you know, give me a hand. So <laughs> help yourself and then God will help you, you know. So they like this the kind of story. Or, or another one with, with young adults that, that they like a lot, you know, like two mischievous, you know, say, Mischief. picaro. Uh, uh, they they go to to a uh, they uh, they talk to each other and they said you know there is a wise man that everybody loves this wise man they are so wise and he knows everything so we can make a trick on him uh, for sure he is going to be after this one not so wise you know but, uh, because uh, we go there and we ask if you know that story please r raise your hand <laughs> well anyway so they said we are going to have a bird and we will ask the wise man if the bird is dead or alive. So it's easy because if he says it's, it's dead, then we let it go and the bird goes. And uh, if he says it's alive, then you push the bird in your uh, pocket and it will be dead. So anyway, you know. So they go there for sure that they are going to, to make this fun and ask him if the bird is they have in the pocket, it's alive or dead. And the uh, wise man says, it depends on you. If you want this bird, is going to die. And if you want, it's going to live. So that's your choice. You took the course, you made it. But no, if you don't do anything more, the, the bird is going to die. And you are the one who is going to, to kill it. You need a credit, you want another course, just come back and, and, and just do it. Yes? Um. Ulrico, you talked a little bit about what success looks like for a woman. You know, her children go to school, she has enough to eat. But I was wondering more broadly, do you try and measure what happens to these women that you assist? Oh, you yes. know, like, do they keep, do they develop a small business? Do their children, in fact, go to school? What exactly. happens, you know, six yes, months, yes, a year yes. later? Yes, yes, you are right. Absolutely, yes. We have the control of this one. We need to. You know, I think the inter-American... Uh, Development Bank, they want to know what happened to the money, what happened to the credit. Yeah. So we have a list of things, what they did and how they did it. And so you how don't they spend it. just concentrate on what you're But it's about, about really to paying back the credit. But That's if they can pay back the credit because they, they, were success, they were successful. So, okay, this is what I'm getting at. So if they pay back the credit, that's all you care about. No. Well, not all you can. I don't maybe the that, bank, yeah. the, maybe the bank responsibility ends there, but not ours. So yeah. So you track actually what they're doing with oh, the yes. money. Oh yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about your operational side. Um, how? Who open? When you open these schools or these centers, who manages those, manages them? What kind of process is involved in starting them? How is one a new one developed? Can you just tell me about that? Yes, I'm going to tell you. Uh, uh, a lot of time it's, it's, I used to say it's uh, the donors who decide. For example, they say, oh, oh I want to help this or that department like uh, La Union or, or San Vicente, and I want to, to do clinics, and I don't want to make uh, schools and so on and so on. So, but uh, some of the donors, they are so nice and generous, they said, okay, if you have a need, maybe you can apply, and then we will build a, a, a structure. But it's not the structure that it's difficult. That's the management. Mm -hmm. uh, we train our own uh, teachers. We don't call them teachers. Uh, we call them facilitadores. 
I don't know how you would translate. Yeah, facilitate. It's, it's it, you know, like they are not professionally teachers, mm -hmm. you know, but we train them and, and we call them every second month and we, we, uh, we are always on top of the, the uh, like training. And they are, they are great. Generally, they are young adults, but we have others. So that's a very, very difficult, uh, uh, like, uh, and do they have burden. to handle the budget? No, 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 no. They not, because we have a, a executive director okay. and some groups that, uh, and then uh, uh, mainly I'm responsible to get the money for the uh, organization. So, okay. but it's very difficult to get the money. Right. And we need at least, like, uh, $15,000 a month just for this part, you know, just for this education. So, but we have to make, uh, okay, we have two or three generating a project. One is a hotel mm -hmm. uh, that we can, we can rent a room, and then we have a training center, so they come and they make, uh, and it's always full. And the other one that uh, the Planned Parenthood, they were giving us long time ago $30,000, and we needed to match with another 30,000 in El Salvador, local money. Mm -hmm. They wanted local money, so we had $60,000, and we bought like five apartments. So we are renting them. And it goes <coughs> back to the, to the children program or the family planning program. Well, what I wanted to talk a little bit more, maybe, it's about synergy. How important, how important can be an NGO well managed, really? Because it's a, a, let's say, we are neutral. We are not with any political group. But, but uh, we want to work. If, if the government needs us, it's OK. We work with them. But we have uh, like a lot of help with Japan, uh, United States government, Canada. With Canada, we made lately three very important projects. One was three children that they were uh, in Ciudad Delgado in one of the worst part by, by crime, you know, in the country, and participated five schools, and they were, uh, we were, we were, OEF was teaching them about self-esteem and against violence and so on and so on. Another one that was uh, Canada training, uh, uh, like, uh, mechanical car reparation, and women, they be like, like, uh, how do you call that, like, cutting the hair, uh, and and uh, making like beauty parlor or something cosmetology. like that. Cosmetology. Cosmetology or something like that. Yeah. What? Oh, hairdresser. Yeah, hairdresser and so on and so on. And and uh, so, but for example, we have uh, FIAS. FIAS is an international organization that we have a, a children program about environment. Because, uh, and it's another thing, you know, that we need to tell everybody that education starts at home. So don't lose time and wait till the child goes to school. So it's very interesting and I love to tell that story and I have a picture because FIAS, uh, they make every year a presentation of the project and they, they need to put it uh, in a hotel or somewhere what they did and how they did. And then every year it's another organization is the, uh, like the honorary member that is going to speech and so on and so on. So we decided when, when it was our turn to put a little boy who could talk, you know, what he learned and what he did. And uh, some of the organizers that said, oh, but he's like from Chalatenango and, and maybe he will be like shy and he's not going to act well and we said that, but he will. And you know what he did? He made a poem for everybody's surprise. And it was like six phrases, and it says, if the children, they go to the woods, they w want to see happy birds chirping, and they want to see like this and that animals. If not, it will be so sad, so we need to keep nature, something like that. It was a big, big, big success. Then came the big American guy who was the official, you know, like a speaker, and he said, you know what? I feel embarrassed what I wrote for my speech because this boy said everything better than I ever could. So it was just a big, big applause. So, but that, for example, um, we have very good uh, OIT, International Organization Internacional del Trabajo. Uh, the ILO. 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 International Labor Organization. Yeah. 
So we had uh, to eliminate child labor. For six or seven years, we had uh, children that we tried to find out the uh, kuril. Do you know how you say it, kuril? It's a small it's a shell that they eat, you know. So poor children, they go, and small children, they go because they have a small hands mm -hmm. to get it from the mud. So all day long, they are in the mud. They have scars and infection if they body because it's it's very, very small place that they need to be there. They don't eat, they smoke. So we had a project with them. They had sugar cane problem. They had waste uh, dumps that the children, they go to work and so on and so on. So uh, when I say synergy, synergy is very important. Rotary Club, they are helping us. Uh, we, we want to make an agricultural project to show the people how to make uh, uh, efficient, it's not a, the problem in El Salvador that we have very limited land and sometimes the land is not good. They have rocks or it's, it's not, not good enough. So how they can treat it, how they can get it in, in boxes or in bamboo to grow vegetable and eat better. So um, it's very, very important the connection that we have with private donors. And a lot of times, private donors, they don't understand the, develop, uh, the, the difference about charity and development. And they come down and they said, oh, we want to help, and so on and so on. And they come and they, give a, they want to give a beauty kit to a poor uh, little girl and give a kiss. And, and that's, it's OK, but then they said, oh, well, you know what? Uh, and then we want to give a TV dinner for the family. TV dinner, why? Oh, you know, it's just you put water and you put into the oven and it's ready. I said, come on, they don't have electricity, they don't have oven. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they come to help. <laughs> but yes, yes. No, go ahead. Finish. No, I just wanted to say that I do believe in charity when it's about sick children or old people that no other way, but I do develop, uh, believe in development. And in El Salvador, and I, I, I say that the problem is and, uh, and I always say that the private sector, for me, they need to do what they can do. For example, uh, uh, if, if you are making snack food, then make the snack well. If you, you do something, do well. And let the development for NGOs or, or ministries. So donate the money. Don't compete. Don't want to do it. But a lot of times in El Salvador, it's, I give you money, Eric, but you behaved. The way I feel that it's correct for me, not for you. Mm -hmm. So the attachment and the condition that they are giving this money. If you just go to development, they go to study, and they don't even know. We don't want to know where the money is coming from. They just need to, to study and do what they, they need to do. Yeah, I appreciate the comment you said earlier on about the fact that a woman who works in a village and a PhD and they meet each other, each other I love things, it. Each I love things it. to teach one another. Exactly. It's something that we often lose sight of around here. Yeah. So I appreciate that insight, <laughs> uh, which is a moral, a moral lesson. Too bad yeah. we had to import it from El Salvador uh, all the way here. We, well, we, I believe that. Here. I, I really do. I, I believe it, too. Okay, so I just want to thank you for that. Okay. But I, I wanted to uh, uh, ask you a, a question about about the role of the free market in alleviating poverty. You outlined in your, in your talk and obviously in your work a whole range of things to, to sort of attack poverty, the structural transformations by the state, behave, changing behavior among the poor yes. themselves, service institutions by private donations and foundations and the work that you do, yes. um, and then leaving it to the free market. And, and I can understand having grown up in a communist country why yes. the free market would be something that would be attractive. Um, but growing, having grown up in the United States, uh, the free market is actually not something I find very attractive, particularly when we, um, it, it, it's almost a religion uh, for people in the West, and for particularly people in the United States. And so, and I often f find that so, many, so much when we talk about development, and we talk about microfinance, and we talk about all of these um, remedies for inequality yeah. that are brought through or affected through a kind of uncritical embrace of free market capitalism as if that is the answer. So it becomes almost another god. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the limitations of the free market approach to the alleviation of poverty. Because to my mind, I do a lot of anti-poverty work in the United States. 
a lot of that poverty is actually perpetuated by the free market. And so I'm wondering, and so I have a very healthy skepticism as anyone who, who's ever come Tim, to Tim, could you could give events. an example? Because you're in the South, right, doing work. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the poverty that I, I work, I run a program, uh, an, an education program in Dorchester uh, for low-income adults. And I also do a lot of work in the South. And the poverty that I see both in Dorchester, which is urban poverty in Boston, and the, the poverty I see in the rural South, which is poverty that dates back to the institution of yeah. slavery and the legacy yeah. that that uh, has, has given us that we will never get over, as far as I'm concerned, um, is really, I think, in some ways um, perpetuated by the fact that you have institutions, banks, and other, I mean, in the South, one of the things that I find very interesting yes. is that many of the rural black folks that I work with in the South are yes. uh, incredibly skeptical of banks still hold their money in jars under the mattress. Because the banks are the institutions of the free market that have actually perpetuated the discrimination against them in terms of being able to start small businesses, in terms of able to get loans for churches that have been burned down by racist <coughs> arsonists, which is the work that I do. And so it seems to me that, that the, and, w and whether or not that skepticism is always justified, I'm, I'm not sure in every case it yeah, is, yeah. but there is among the poor, uh, a healthy skepticism of the free market that I actually share. And yeah. so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, because I heard a lot of free market yeah, 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 solutions yeah. here. I know, I, I know. I'm just wondering I know. what you see. Um, listen, it's very interesting, very, very interesting. And I need to tell you, since the moment I knew I'm coming here, mm. I kind of didn't know which way to go and how to present what I do, or what is that I really want to say. And one of the approaches, and it's this other paper, mm -hmm. it's exactly what you just said. That the problem with this, uh, uh, that the 21st century uh, is generally called the information and globalization age, yeah. which means that there are no borders and everyone can be connected with the rest of the world. But there is more than half of the people that it's no way who say that they will be connected. We are just kidding each other, yeah, you know? So it's, it's no way. And, and when they are speaking about uh, gender equity, you know, equity is really something so, so difficult. Because uh, <laughs> I used to say the first uh, uh, like injustice is life that you don't choose your parents. You don't know which family you are born. So that's, that's basic. But, uh, and I was talking to Eric and, and try to see because uh, knowing that, uh, for example, my husband, okay, I don't suppose to speak about Pablo, but, but I need to speak about him. So when he started the factory, he made an agreement with the Ministry of Education to teach everybody how to read and write. Mm -hmm. Because he said, I don't want a communist country like Cuba to come and teach the people of El Salvador to read and write. It's a shame that at the end of the 20th century, people, they don't know how to read and write. So, so uh, and in Peru, in the uh, high uh, uh, mountains and in Bolivia, they are never going to be part of this global world and the banks and so on and so on. So it's an exchange. And that's another thing that I say. For example, we go and teach the woman how to cut the hair and cosmetology. We never tell her that she will successful enough to make a globalization part of her life. She doesn't know the price, who is uh, competing against. And we don't tell her that she will be able to go to the best part of San Salvador, that it's Escalon, 